All right, if you are there already, if not, Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and let Israel be glad. Psalm 14 is a rather sobering psalm. It reveals to us a truth about who we are, a truth about humanity, despite some of the uh, common messages that we get in culture today, in the world today. Uh, this reveals who we truly are. I want to kind of set the stage by quoting R.C. Sproul. He said, As the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, so the denial of God is the height of foolishness. Now, Psalm 14 is really a diagnosis of those who would deny God. Uh, it actually shows the futility of denying Him. David, as he observes the wicked and their contempt of God, he considers them fools. Uh, this is a rather honest title uh, that he gives to these individuals, but in a sense, and in many ways, it's a title that can be said of many of us. Actually, all of us. And the psalm shows us that. It reveals to us. And so, the fools that David is referring to, uh, profane people who have cast off all fear of God and have given themselves to uh, wickedness and infamy. Individuals who are convinced of madness and delusion, those who despise and mock God. Uh, these individuals who are applauded by the world, they're celebrated by those who advocate evil, uh, those who have abandoned all sense of God and, and can no longer distinguish between right and wrong. They have no regard for honesty, no concern for humanity, and their investments stand in opposition to the sovereignty of the Lord that we have been studying and really looking at all throughout the Psalms. Now, this is not a very flattering description of a person. Yet what it really speaks to is the absurdity of a posture that denies and rejects and detests the truth. Uh, John Calvin so plainly comments on this reality. He says, For there is no stupidity more brutish than forgetfulness of God. That there is no stupidity more devilish or more detestable than forgetfulness of God. And even further to build on that point, the rejection of God isn't even done, as we see in this psalm, in some lengthy uh, or formal logic or argument. Uh, there's no formalized debate with uh, well-articulated rebuttals. Uh, they don't articulate their assertion by meaningful rationale. Uh, they simply conclude, as we see in verse 1, there is no God. Uh, many arguments over the years reject this idea of aseity, the aseity of God, this doctrine of God's self-existence, that God is entirely self-sufficient. He's not dependent or contingent upon anything else, that ultimately God is the eternal, independent, and personal cause of the entire universe. Now, while some thinkers appeal to self-creation uh, in order to account for reality, 
if you think about it, uh, seriously, it's fundamentally illogical. In order for anything to exist, an uncaused something or someone must exist. It's not an uncaused effect, if you will, that must exist because there is no such thing. The uncaused something, i.e. God, must have the power of being within itself, must exist in and of itself, and must be eternal. And what we know to be true is that the only uh, personal, self-existent one is God. That He is the Creator. And so that's the only logical argument that explains creation. It's the only logical explanation that adequately explains the design and the origin and the personality that is evident in the universe. Ultimately, uh, revealing to us that assumptions of chance and uh, naturalistic evolution are not sufficient to explain reality. Now, I've spoken to some individuals who believe in what we call evolution, and some in the world of academia would argue that these statements are not sufficient enough to explain uh, the universe, that they're based on some flimsy worldview, that this conviction lacks structure and substance. But for those who are in Christ, uh, we know that our view of the world and its contents is centered around the existence of a personal and holy and transcendent creator. And Psalm 14 shows us that only fools deny the Lord's existence. I have a silly example for you. Um, I was trying to think of probably the most sophisticated form of technology that we have, our cell phones. Um, It's foolish to think that your cell phone, this sophisticated piece of equipment, wherever it was put together, that it's somehow formed by that plant or that lab exploding. And then an iPhone just popped out. It's illogical. It doesn't make any sense. But it is quite logical to know with certainty uh, that there is a designer behind the idea of this phone that we carry in the first place. And so although that's an insufficient example, and through the inability to find anything as complex as the universe to sustain, uh, denying God is a foolish occupation. And in verse 1, David assesses the wicked as fools. They're corrupt. They do abominable deeds. They're is none who does good. And then in verse 2, we see how the Lord assesses the wicked. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. That God looks down, if you will, to see if there are any who understand and seek after God. That God is always observing men, gazing intently upon men, and that although God has no need to search the hearts of men to discover the truth about them, David describes God's conclusion upon his observing and gazing is that all humanity, all humanity is corrupt and estranged from God. Now, this is Uh, completely contrary to popular teaching even in the church today. We deceive ourselves into thinking that man on our own somehow has the desire to seek God. Uh, As a matter of fact, it would be a much more accurate assessment of humanity to assert that we will never seek God on our own. Uh, That we actually love the idea of the proclamation that we see in verse 1 that there is no God. We would prefer to be autonomous. We would prefer to lead our own lives, to do our own thing, to fend for ourselves. Uh, We, in and of ourselves, turn our back on our Creator. If we, think about this, for one millisecond, 
as believers in Christ were left alone by the Holy Spirit, we would engage in a depravity so vile that we would wince at the result of being unattended to in that moment. As Charles Spurgeon says, and quite honestly, I, his sermon on Psalm 14, I was just going to read it to you, literally. It's that good. He says, you cannot slander human nature. It is worse than you can paint it. Humanity is completely depraved. We see this continued in verse 3. It says, they've all turned aside. Together they've become corrupt. None who does good, not even one. Again, when God looks, what he finds is that man has turned away from God, uh, turned aside. In the original language, it means grown sour. Uh, the Hebrew word is actually the same uh, that is used for a dead carcass, a stench. David observes and remembers that man is truly and profoundly and deeply fallen. And this really broadens the scope beyond those who deny God, and it includes us as well. So, so in other words, uh, the outspoken atheist, if you will, uh, and the denier of God that we see in verse 1 is actually an example of mankind in general. And this is our starting point. To, to quote Spurgeon once again, humanity is fallen and debased, a, a desert without an oasis, a night without a star, a dunghill without a jewel, a hell without a bottom. That until God makes us new creatures by his mysterious grace through the work of the cross and the complete work of Christ, we are contaminated with filth and folly. Now, some may object, and they may say, ah, that's a little too harsh. You're a little too intense there, buddy. You know, calm down a little bit. Uh, you're a little severe, crude, bleak. You did mention last week you're the glass half empty kind of guy, right? But isn't this why we can actually sing of God's grace being so amazing? This is why we can proclaim that God's mercy is abundant. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. The, the diagnosis of the one who denies God as being a fool is impartial because we're all fools. This is not a put down of people's competence or intellectual capacity. Uh, it's a painful yet truthful description of our rebellion. There is none who do good, not even one. Paul uh, quotes this in Romans 3 as well. When we confess that our nature is corrupt, it is there that we begin to see the mercy extended to us more fully, to where sin no longer has dominion over us, but to where we instead see that grace rules and reigns. And that is good news, that we were dead in our sin, bound for hell, separated from God, but that through the work of Christ on our behalf, we are given the gift of grace and extended mercy, given a righteousness that we cannot earn, acquire, or secure on our own. So that for those whom before the foundation of the world, who were chosen by the Father, would be given life and life eternal, despite our propensity and our leaning and our appetite for sin. That is amazing. It's foolish to deny that truth. You know, one of the problems feeding people's misunderstanding of our relationship to God nowadays is that we start in the wrong place. That the good news of Jesus Christ, if you were to, if you were to be asked again to articulate the gospel, well, it starts because he loves us. That's true. But that's not the starting point point 
what makes the gospel such good news is that we are sinful, wretched, depraved people to whom the Lord chose to save. Because you see, if that's our starting point, that the reason that the gospel is good news is only because Jesus loved us, it actually opens the door for many different liberties to be taken. Accommodating sin, which we see running rampant right now. Um, Accepting sin, embracing sin, um, celebrating it. And it makes our vileness something that can be overlooked rather than something that needs to be dealt with. And Psalm 14 shows us that we must start with the nature of all humanity, wretched, depraved, bound by sin, no one good. And that the reason that the gospel is good news is because it deals with the news regarding all humanity, which is fundamentally bad. And that it is through Christ's love, through God's love for us, that we would be extended grace and mercy. But we start with our desperate need for a Savior because of our wretchedness. In verse 4, the description of the fool goes a bit further. And we're confronted with the truth that fools not only reject God, but they also never learn Uh, They have no knowledge. They eat up people as they eat bread. They do not call upon the Lord. That through all of the emptiness of their pursuits, they are still convinced of their way. They're employed by iniquity. Having no knowledge of divine things, they enslave themselves to devouring others. They're bondsmen, if you will, of evil. Then in verse 5, we see an answer to the question that's posed in verse 4. In verse 4, he says, Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord. Verse 5 is an answer. It's a reminder of a reality that they all understand. Verse 5, There they are in great terror, for God is with the generation of the righteous. This is a reminder that even in their foolishness, even though they fail to admit it, that although the workers of iniquity seem strong and confident, they actually live in great fear. And they live in fear because they cannot erase the awareness that God is with the righteous. The Hebrew helps understand this a little bit. It's written this way, an undefinable, horrible, mysterious dread crept over them. That their familiarity with God's control over the affairs of the universe uh, casts them into a cold sweat, if you will. That they live in the cloud of knowing that they are battling against God and they know that they can never win, but they'll never admit it. And they continue on in their ways. And that even though they continue to employ their greatest weapons as an onslaught as against the vulnerable, the refuge of God, the care of God, the security of God cannot be breached. Essentially, they're fighting against God and they will, not, they will never succeed. This is another sign of their foolishness. Almost like when my 11-year-old squares up with me, you know, and tries to, to shadow box me. You don't stand a chance, buddy. This fear is brought onto those who deny God because they know that God is ultimately in control. They just fail to admit that. They just neglect to admit that. They're foolish in their foolishness, this fruitless, insufficient, unavailing pursuit. They lead lives of fear and exposure, never learning, seeking advantage at the expense of others, shaming the poor, scoffing at the faithful, and even further, looking at the faithful, waiting on God 
and trust in his sure deliverance. They actually call them fools. So the foolish call those who wait on God and trust in God fools. It's this never-ending cycle of mocking God and their arrogance and walking around as if they are untouchable. This verse also shows us that the Lord is our refuge, that we are completely dependent on God, and God observes and knows the end of the wicked. So we see that the fool says there is no God. The fool mocks and taunts God. And then in verse 7, we see that the fool will be shamed by God. He says, Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. David anticipates the coming deliverance, and he calls the people of God to be joyful in consideration of it. David looks directly to God, who alone is deliverer, and he calls for restoration. He calls for rejoicing. So what do we do with this psalm? What do we take away from this psalm? Well, for one, there is no neutral place, no intermediate alternative between devotion to the Lord and rebellion against God. There is no in-between. There's only wisdom and only foolishness. There's only obedience and only rebellion. There's only boasting in the Lord or boasting in one's own sinful desires. And two, there's truly only one place that we can find the solution to the problem of our sin nature. And it should cause us to trust in the most certain reality of all. The great deliverer, the one who conquers sin and death, the one who sought us and found us despite us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's simply foolish to look anywhere else. Even though our propensity is to do so. One of my go-to scriptures that I always reference, that I always like to remind myself of, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. The end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Father, I pray that today as we study your word, as we come to understand how wretched we are, how depraved we are, that that would shine a bright light onto your grace and your mercy and the work that you have done on our behalf despite ourselves. I pray that you would remind us of this truth each and every day that we would not for one second become too prideful, boast in our own way, but that we would be continually reminded of our desperate need for you. That the reason that the gospel is good news is because the truth about humanity is fundamentally bad news. And I pray that we are reminded of that truth this day. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.